We have with us John Lehman, Jonathan Clark, and Steph Halper, who need no introduction, but I will introduce them very briefly. We want to thank John Lehman, who just got off the train from D.C. to be with us this evening. And we appreciate that he was able to come here this, this night. Also, I would like to thank the Foreign Policy Association for working in conjunction with us to make this event happen. Without them, without their help, this event would not have been possible. So thank you to everyone. Our authors of America Alone, Steph Halper and Jonathan Clark, are, are seated here. And we are pleased to have our three guests with us this evening. Thank you again. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here to have the honor to, uh, to introduce these distinguished uh, gentlemen. Uh, Steph Halper uh, is uh, a fellow fellow of, uh, of uh, Cambridge and uh, a former uh, co-conspirator of many years in Washington. Uh, Jonathan Clark, as you all know, is a veteran diplomat and uh, thinker and doer and author uh, uh, from the other side of the pond, and uh, and they have uh, produced a book that I think is already causing uh, quite a stir and and has uh, has uh, lots of new uh, uh, and insightful ways to look at uh, what's going on in the world today, and I think it's going to lead to a very lively discussion uh, today. Steph is. Uh, uh, a, a man of considerable experience, and uh, it, it's, it's what makes this book, I think, so valuable because both of its authors are men of action as well as uh, men of the intellect. And, uh, and so their book comes not just from a, an academic perspective, but from the perspective of one uh, of both authors who have have been there, done that, uh, wrestled with these issues in the real world, uh, had to fight their way through bureaucracies to get things done, and uh, at the same time have done it in a thinking way and a lessons lear lesson learning way. And that's what makes this book so, uh, so unique. Also, the, the fact that we have here a, a collaboration of uh, of the, the two perspectives from the Atlantic community, at least the pillars of the Atlantic com community, the United States and the UK, uh, I think it is, uh, it, it is significant because really, uh, I think the, uh, the Anglo-Saxons in the Atlantic Alliance are going to have increasingly to, to be the leaders in thinking through dealing with a world environment that today that is totally different and unprecedented uh, in our uh, uh, any of our experience. Uh, this is a different world, and the, the, the challenge of transnational uh, Islamic uh, terrorism is, is unique. It, uh, neither of our governments and, and the NATO alliance is not set up to deal adequately uh, with this phenomenon. And, uh, and so far, a coherent world view that can be a framework for a strategy uh, for, uh, for the Atlantic community has not really uh, coalesced. And the book uh, highlights uh, one clash of ideas that within our uh, policy community today that is perhaps the most significant uh, one between two contending schools of thought, and it cuts across uh, both the political parties uh, in the United States and the political parties in the, in the UK. Uh, it's an old clash in some ways between idealism and realism, but in a very new form. And so uh, I think that uh, you have here the cutting edge of the, the intellectual policy debate that, uh, that really is at the center of our governments uh, today. And uh, uh, I, I was a little afraid when, uh, when our hostess started out and said, uh, these three men don't need any introduction. I was afraid she wasn't going to give us one. 
And I remember uh, when I introduced my old boss, Henry Kissinger, who has been on this forum uh, many times in the past, I introduced him as, uh, here as a man who needs no introduction, my boss, Henry Kissinger, and he took me aside afterwards and he said, Lehman, don't you understand that those of us who are introduced as needing no introduction are the ones who crave it the most? <laughs> So I'd like to give you a man today who needs no introduction. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Um, allow me to um, uh, thank uh, Kira Citron and also Taka uh, Puchiki uh, for their kind arrangements of this event this evening. Uh, at the Metropolitan Club. And I'd just like to say to all of you that we uh, owe a great debt of gratitude to John Lehman, who was serving on the 9-11 Commission in one of the most delicate political jobs that uh, one could imagine. And uh, he does deserve great credit. <clears throat> John is a special friend. Uh, we've worked together since he was a staffer in the Senate Armed Services Committee, and I was policy director for Bush's uh, primary campaign against Ronald Reagan. That was a very long time ago. Uh, John was an invaluable source of guidance on all things military and political in those days, and he was on Capitol Hill. And of course, over the years, his many kindnesses, uh, we remember a particularly remarkable uh, July 4th in 17, uh, 1976. <laughs> <laughs> when the tall ships came to uh, New York Harbor, and uh, I and my family were his guests on the battleship New Jersey. John was, at that time, Secretary of the Navy, uh, I believe. I hope I'm getting that right. I believe you were at that time. Um, John Lehman built the largest Navy the world has ever seen as Secretary of the Navy. Um, uh, but it his, it's his friendship and his support that shines through here and uh, where we have common purpose in, in Cambridge, where uh, he's also a don at uh, Gonville and Keys. So I want to thank you, John. As you may be aware, America Alone, uh, the book that we've just completed, arises from the center right. As a Republican who has served three presidents in the White House and State Department, and as a strong supporter of this president in the year 2000, uh, we concluded at the start of the Iraq war that the administration's foreign policy had taken a detour, that it was a dangerously, it was a policy that was dangerously driven by ideology rather than a clear understanding of American interests, and that the administration had failed to effectively use the full range of diplomatic, economic, political, and personal relationships uh, before it moved to a military intervention. And with our bitter uh, post-conflict experience in attempting to reconstruct Iraq, it seems that the policies advanced by the neoconservatives do not appear to have served this administration uh, or the nation to its greatest advantage. Those are some of the points that we're covering in the book. We conclude that the effort to contain terror which is something that the 9-11 Commission is looking at very, very carefully. But we concluded that um, that effort of necessity competed with Iraq uh, for resources, namely military resources, intelligence, man management time, including the time and efforts of senior national security officials. Uh, it was our view in the book that the utopian objectives that is to say, the neoconservative strategy to remake an entire region, to recast an ancient culture and alter the social and cultural tenets of many millions of people to reflect market democracy, that that objective could not be reached, at least not for several generations. And that the effort uh, would conclude by demonstrating the limits of American power uh, 
not its capabilities. Um, <clears throat> Living in England and teaching at Cambridge, uh, we've also become very much aware of a sharp decline in American credibility abroad, even among those who are our closest allies, who loved us as a people and wanted very much to support us, but found increasingly uh, that they were separating from the Blair government's policies. So the book was written to provide definition and perspective to these developments, to establish the terms of debate in hopes of restoring balance in our foreign policy, the book underscores the costs of the current policy in terms of men and money and credibility and opportunities lost to address other problems. The book underscores the critical importance of restoring the checks and balances in the policy process that may have been distorted by a small, well-placed group. We urge a return to a risk-sensitive, alliance-oriented policy that builds on uh, the institutions that the United States has so painstakingly created over the last past uh, century, half of a century. It is a book of record. It has some 1,400 footnotes and an extensive bibliography. And in that context, let me recognize two of the researchers today, Leslie Halper here and Ben Ryder, who did a great deal of work on this in Cambridge. It um, looks at who the neoconservatives are, where they came from, what they believe, and how they assume such great power. It examines how the administration constructed a conditional reality and moved the nation to war against it. Conditional reality being Saddam Hussein might have weapons of mass destruction, might have links to al-Qaeda, might have been involved in 9-11, and so on. It was a series of conditional or possibilities which eventually became a reality that people, uh, many, many people believed. Um, the book also looks at the echo chamber in which the White House, uh, White House statements were echoed by Fox Television, Wall Street Journal editorial pages, even the Washington Post and other papers and prominent talk radio, 